Well, good morning, church. It is so good to be together this morning. And to those of you that are joining us online, you are most welcome. I just want to invite you this morning to turn up your expectation. Turn up your expectation because I believe that the Lord has something to say to you this morning. So begin to just be expectant, begin to be hungry, and I know that the Lord's going to speak to you this morning. So let us pray. Father, we just thank you for this day. It is a day you have made, and we will rejoice in it, and we will be glad. And Father, I thank you for those that are watching online and for those that are in the building, Father. Lord, I pray that you visit with each person today in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Over to the worship team.
Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Who sing a little louder? Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder.
desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written Jesus Christ my living hope who could imagine who could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace the God of angels stepped down from glory to where my sin and bear my shame the cross has spoken I am forgiven the King of Kings calls me his own beautiful Savior I'm yours forever it's Jesus Christ my Lord No claim on me. Then came, then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your very body began to breathe out of the silence. The roaring lion declared. Because when you're battling with your storm in your life, when you feel like there's just darkness all around, guess what? There is hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. The promise of God never changes, church. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever for us. 
So as we sing that verse one more time, let's mean the song we're singing. Let's sing it out in faith. Then came the morning. It may feel like you're in the valley, the middle of your valley right now. But guess what, church? Then came the morning. Amen. So let's sing that one more time. Then came the morning. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. How long the the world. 
the king of life was on the move. For in a dark old tomb, where I thought was made, one miraculous
So 
exalt you this morning, Father. Come on, church. This is such a holy moment. I just really sense the presence of the Lord is here. Just take a minute. Just take a minute. Just take a minute. You know what? The Lord is here this morning. And He just wants to give you peace and joy. Just give Him a bit of time in this holy moment. This is all about Him right now, not about you. Just worship Him this morning, just for a minute, church. Just allow the presence of the Holy Spirit just begin just to fall on you this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. He's so worthy this morning. He is so worthy of all our praises. He is so worthy to be adored this morning. No matter what is going on in your life, the Lord is still worthy. The Lord is still mighty and the Lord still loves you. So allow Him to be worthy in your life this morning. Just begin to say, Lord, You are worthy. Lord, You are worthy. You are worthy of it all, Father. Just begin to say that this morning, church. You are worthy of it all, Lord. You are worthy of it all, Jesus. You are worthy this morning to be glorified. You are worthy to be praised. You are worthy to be magnified. You are worthy because you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And there is none beside thee, mighty God. This morning you are worthy. You are worthy. We fix our eyes upon you this morning because you are a worthy God. You are worthy, 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 worthy. We join with the angels this morning and we declare, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lord this morning. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Oh, Father. Oh, we worship you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Father, we just so grateful that the Lord of the heavens and the earth comes and dwells with us. Such a great God comes and dwells in such a small place. But you came and you made your home within our hearts, Father. And this morning we are so grateful for that, Lord. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you have been moving in our hearts already this morning. And we are expectant for a great move of God in this house, Lord. We're hungry for that great move this morning. We are hungry for more of your presence, for more of the word, for more of you, Jesus, in everything that we do, Lord. And your word says that if you're hungry, you will satisfy us. If we are thirsty, you will fill us this morning. So church, the Lord is ready to fill you. Are you hungry for him? (laughs) Are you desperate for him this morning? I am. I want so much more of Jesus in my life. Amen. I don't even know. I don't really feel like stopping, but we do need to. (laughs) We could just probably worship for a little while longer. But this is a holy moment, and we're not stopping our worship now. We're going to go into the business of our church, and we're also going to go into giving, and we're going to go into the Word. And the way you receive that this morning is a holy thing, because that's also worship. Amen. I just want you to say, I love you, Jesus, and take your seats. Amen. Thank you, worship team. Wonderful time of worship this morning. Well, it's so good to be in the house of the Lord. Really, really good to be in the house of the Lord. Wow. Gosh. I feel a bit drunk, actually, up here. (laughs) Anyway, we're just so grateful to be here this morning. If you are a little fish... You can go downstairs, they're already waiting for you, and I know that you'll be having a really good time down there. Um, And so also this morning, we just want to welcome you if you are new to our church, if this is your first time, or maybe you haven't been in a while and you've just come back to visit well, you are welcome. We really, really are pleased to have you with us, and also for those of you that are watching online, it's good to have you with us. After the service, you're welcome to pop up to the black tent and come and join the team. And there's a team of ladies that will meet with you and have a coffee and a little welcome bag. 
Um, City, we- City Word, this is the last week for City Word. Um, week six, so this is Galatians. We've been doing the book of Galatians. Um, and this will be the last Wednesday for that. So those of you that have been coming, I know you've been really blessed. But you can still come anyway, even if you haven't been, because I know God will speak to you. Then, City Youth, um, Friday the 15th, uh, we have our summer prom. I'm saying it like I'm going. <laughs> it's not my summer prom. Don't worry, I won't come. I won't spoil the party. <laughs> okay, so summer prom 2022. Wow, that's amazing. Gosh, can you believe it? It's like nearly the middle of July, Apostle is. Right, I know, halfway. Christmas is coming. Oh, yay. Anyway, last Friday night before we close for the summer. So please book your place via the website and the registration opens today. All right, so that's for the summer prom. And then City Kids, you can tell summer's on its way, all these exciting things. City Kids Summer Club is back on this year. Woohoo! I know the youth of some of the guys have done amazing. Even during lockdown, we had it online. I mean, we've got such amazing people in our church, haven't we? So um, we've got three days of fun, craft, games, and Bible stories. Uh, Wilderness Explorers um, is for children's ages 4 to 11, and from the 24th to the 26th of August from 9 to 3 p.m. So that's a really nice day um, for your children to come along, and it's not just about fun, because I'm sure in there they'll talk about Jesus as well. And it's a great way to reach into the community. So children, bring your friends, your neighbors. And I know, I mean, City Kids always been amazing. And I know you'll have a really, really good time. So church, if you want to stay connected with anything that's going on in our church, um, there's a little poster around and it's got a little QR code on it. Please just go and scan that in. It will take you directly onto the website where you can register for events or you can find out what's happening in the life of City Faith. And um, yeah, and at the end of the service, please don't rush off home. There's some time to have tea and coffee with us afterwards. And now I'm going to welcome the Holy Reverend, Her Royal Highness, the Queen, to come and do the offering. Thank you. Oh, this is a bit loud, Callum. Thanks. A bit boomy. Right, church, are you excited to give this morning? Or have you all switched off? As I came up, click, click, click. I could see it. Click, 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 click. Come on, it's time to switch back on. This is a continuation this morning of our worship. What an incredible job the band did today. I just love it when um, we can just so easily enter into the presence of God. Amen. And it doesn't just happen here on a Sunday. They are here in the week. They're practicing. They're they're seeking God in the week. They're praying. Uh, So it's not just what you see on a Sunday. It's a week's worth of, of seeking after the heart of God and getting their lives right. So how about we just give it up one more time for our awesome worship team this morning. Oh, come on. If you're going to give it up for somebody, at least make them feel... Sounds like you're all watching golf. Don't know about worship. (laughs) You know, if we're going to appreciate somebody, we appreciate them. Amen? Come on, no half-heartedness. And that goes for our giving this morning. So this morning, I just want to share a very very quick account in the book of John. It's a miracle that Jesus performed. And uh, it's uh, the story of the feeding of the 5,000. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. We all know about the fact that Jesus fed not only 5,000 men, but he fed the women and the children as well. And I just, uh, this is just such an amazing miracle. And Jesus is here in Galilee and he has been preaching um, to this crowd of people all day. And uh, he's been preaching for hours and hours and hours and hours. And um, whoever sits here on a Sunday and you think about what you're going to have for lunch, especially now. So if you're thinking about who sits here, and by the end of the service, your stomach is rumbling. You've only been sat here for like an hour and a half. And by the end of the service, you're already a bit hungry. And some of you, by the time you get up and grab a coffee, you're disappointed because there's no biscuits because you're really hangry at this stage. And, uh, but here they are. They've been sat all day listening to Jesus teach. Uh, so he's been feeding them spiritually. This has got a real boom on it. I don't know if we can fix that. It's, it's quite, um, I don't want to have to be quiet and sedate. I want to give it some welly this morning, okay? So, but here he is, he's been teaching all day. And these guys are hungry. He's been feeding them spiritually. And now Jesus decides in order to keep, because he doesn't want them to go home. Now, I'm sure some of you, if you were cheeky enough and were really hungry, you'd pop downtown and grab a snack and come back and hope nobody would notice you. But these guys, Jesus didn't want them leaving his teaching. He didn't want, him, he didn't want them leaving from his presence. So he'd fed them spiritually. Now he's going to feed them physically. But there's no food. 
Do you ever go out for the day uh, and you realise that you haven't packed your picnic or you've left it on the side in the kitchen or you've eaten it by 11 o'clock and it gets to two and you're still hungry? So here they are, they're sat there, they're hungry. And we're not talking like 200 people, we're talking 5,000 plus the women and the children. And there was, dare I say it, no birth control back then. So I'm sure they had lots of children, not one or two. There would have been thousands to feed, okay? So you get this picture in your mind. They've been fed spiritually. Now Jesus wants to feed them physically. And there's a little boy who offers his happy meal. It's all he's got, a little happy meal. We all know those don't sustain anybody. <laughs> but it was a happy meal. It was just five loaves and two fish. That's all he had. And he took it to Jesus and, and he offered it. And what happened when Jesus got involved with that happy meal? It fed the 5,000, the women and the children. But the story doesn't stop there. It goes on to say that afterwards they collected, they didn't want any waste. They collected 12 baskets of, overfull, of overflow. So 12 baskets, and I'm sure it, weren't, it wasn't the crumbs. I'm sure it wasn't like just the, the, the bone of the fish. I'm sure it was full fish and full loaves. There was plenty left over. Now you might be sat here this morning thinking, what difference does my small gift make in the kingdom of God this morning? What difference will the few pence and pounds that I can sow into this church, what difference will it make this morning? See, that a lot, the enemy is lying to you this morning to keep those things in your pocket. See, it's when Jesus gets involved, when you put your offering into the hands of Jesus, that's where the miracle takes place. That's when you place your happy meal this morning into Jesus' hands. That's where the miracle and the multiplication takes place. That's where the overflow. And let me tell somebody this morning that if you're obedient to the things of God with your giving, God will not only supply your needs, but he will supersede the needs in your life. Come on, we serve a God of the abundance. We serve a God of the overflow. See, God isn't interested in the little or the much that you have. He's interested this morning in your obedience. And when you're obedient to the things of God, particularly, Particularly when it's giving, that's where the miracles and the breakthrough and the change and the transformation and the abundance starts to take place. Amen? Amen? Amen. Pastor Wisdom, you're distracting everybody this morning. <laughs> Actually, Pastor Wisdom isn't distracting you. You're distracting yourselves. Come on. Pastor Wisdom, we love you. He's off on, on holidays soon. Is this your last Sunday, right? Yeah, he's off on holidays. Everybody's going on holiday this year. <laughs> him and his family, we bless him. But do you get what God is saying this morning, church? It doesn't matter what you sow this morning. It's your obedience in sowing that will bring the miracle that you need in your finances. Amen. So if you're believing God for breakthrough with your finances this morning, be obedient to what God is asking. Put your offering, put your giving into the hands of Jesus this morning because he wants to miraculously feed 5,000 men, women and children. Not only that, but he wants an overflow for your life. He wants you to be able to gather up 12 baskets of full bread and full fish. Amen. So a church, are we ready to give this morning? I preach myself happy. I don't know about you this morning. <laughs> but I'm ready. Come on. We need to sow into this amazing, this is an amazing story, an amazing opportunity that we get to partner with the heart of God for our city. Amen. So are we ready, church, to give this morning? The bank details are up. If you give online, then just hold your offering in your, in your hand like this this morning as we pray. If you're physically giving, if you're giving online, then you join us with this prayer this morning. Father, we thank you that as we sow into your kingdom this morning, Father, we thank you that as we are obedient to sow the seeds that you are asking of us, Father, we thank you as we place our giving into your hands, that you will miraculously multiply for the needs of this city, for the needs of this church, and for our needs of our family. Father, we thank you that it is with good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Father, we honor you this morning with our giving, and we love you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's take up the offering this morning. Yep, come on, let's. We're going to praise. Don't forget, if we're going to praise, we're going to praise properly. Otherwise, it does sound like you're watching golf. Okay, so Pastor Sean, are you ready? We're going to hear the word this morning. The honor of hearing Pastor Word, uh, Pastor Word, Pastor Sean teach the word this morning. Have you, Mike? Yeah. Okay. Morning, church. No, yes. I quite happily be known as Pastor Word. <laughs> That's a right honor there. I tell you what, for me anyway. Are you all well? 
open your Bibles to the book of John chapter 2, please. Um, I'll apologize in advance to the, to the team. I have lots of scripture today and I didn't send it to them. Let's pray. Father, bless your name, Lord God. Thank you, Lord, that you've gone ahead of us this morning, Lord. Thank you, Father, that you've prepared a way, Father. We come to you with expectant hearts, Lord, with a desire to be challenged and changed, to be formed into your likeness, Lord God. Holy Spirit, we commit this time to you, Lord. We ask that you will take it and, and guide us and direct us into the fullness of what you would have us grasp this morning, Lord. I pray for open ears and open hearts, Lord God, and I pray that the word would come forth as directly from you, Father. In Jesus' precious name, we bless you, and we thank you, Lord God. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm conducting a bit of an experiment this morning. Normally, I have three pages of notes when I preach. This morning, I've got one and a half. So we're either going to be finished in 20 minutes, or I'm going to preach for an hour anyway. <laughs> Who said amen? Just for you, Pastor. If, if anyone misses their lunch today, it's his fault, okay? I take that as a personal challenge. <laughs> Praise the Lord. No, the reason, the reason, I mean, I, I don't make three pages of notes just because I want three pages of notes. It's because usually what God says. But God's only said this this morning. And so I, I've got to be honest, when I prepared for this message, um, I, I've wrestled tremendously with the word this morning. Not because it's a tough word, because it's a really challenging word in a good way. Um, and so, le well, let me try and make sense of that. Let's start with John chapter 2 and verse 1 through 11. It's the wedding at, at Cana. Uh, and, and I want to read it. I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. It says, On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, What business do you have with me, woman? I spoke to my mother like that. <clears throat> my mother has, my hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, whatever he tells you to do, do it. Now, there were six stone water pots standing, standing where, uh, there for the Jewish custom of purification containing two or three measures each. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. So they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. And they took it to him. And now when the head waiter tasted the water, which had become wine, and did not know where it had come from, but the servant who had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the groom, and he said to him, every man serves the good wine first, and when the guests are drunk, then he serves the poorer wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. The beginning of his signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. So this morning's message is called Miracles for Dummies. Now, I realized when I, I was talking to Pastor Lucy on text about that, that, that some of you may not get the, the reference. For those of you that don't, there's a series of books called Songwriting for Dummies and, and Satan for Dummies and all sorts of things for dummies. So that's why I've called this Miracles for Dummies. It's, it's from my perspective, a, a really introductory look at the miraculous in our lives. I've been massively challenged over the last few years. I've contemplated and meditated uh, at great length on the lack of the miraculous in my own life. Uh, I have in the past seen it tremendously, and we have seen it recently, uh, but uh, we don't see it as much as I desire for it to be there. And we certainly don't see it as much as the word sort of implies that it should be there. And so I've been meditating and challenged, uh, meditating the word and being challenged by this. Uh, and, and I think it's significant for us because if you look at the little red flag, as you not so little, the big enormous red flag as you walk through the front door, it's City Faith, a place where miracles happen. And you can't look at the church to provide miracles because the church is a reflection of you and I. If you and I are not in a place to understand, receive, grasp, believe, and expect the miraculous, then the, they're not going to reflect in the church. And so uh, this is why I've, I've, I've been a bit reluctant to minister this word this morning because it, I found it immensely challenging. And whenever you bring a word or you hear a word, you have an opportunity to either reject it or be accountable to it and respond to it. And I believe that is where we stand today. So let me start with a few questions. Honestly, genuinely, don't answer this to yourself. Just answer it to yourself. Don't answer it publicly. 
How many of you have in your life experienced a genuine miracle? You personally. Not heard about it or saw about it. Don't stick your hands up. Just if you personally have experienced a genuine miracle. You. To you. I want you to think about that for a minute. And I want you to notice how difficult it is to come up with one. How many of you have seen a genuine miracle? Not heard about one. Witnessed someone else experienced one. Witness someone receive one in a church or at a meeting or somewhere. Think about that. Okay. Now I want to ask an even more serious question. And I'm going to give you a minute to reflect on it. How many of you today need a miracle? Think about that for a minute. If your answer is yes, can I ask you to stick your hand up? Keep your hand up. You're taking notes. No, we're not. Just look around. Look at all the hands. I could put my hand up as well. I need a miracle. Thank you very much. So one of two things will happen. You can put your hands down. You're going to see one of two responses. You're going to see people, a large number of people needing miracles, which is what we have here. Or you're going to see very few hands going up because people, A, don't believe in the miraculous, B, have no expectation for it or any faith for it. Edwin Louis Cole said something very profound. He said, expectancy is the atmosphere for, mir for the miraculous. If you haven't got an expectant heart for the miraculous, it's just going to pass you by. You're not going to notice that you even have a need. It excites me and encourages me to see so many people in this place today that need and notice I didn't say want, I said need. There are people sitting here that need a miracle. My wife and I need a miracle to happen. Not next year, now. We live, as do you all, in a place where God must work on my behalf, otherwise we're in trouble. We stuck, we lost, we stay broken, sick, bound, whatever it might be. Folks, here's the reality is all of us need the miraculous touch of God every day in our lives. It should be something. Thank you, Pastor Les. The rest of you want to join in on the back end of that? Amen. It should be something that is normal to us. Amen. We should live in the miraculous or in a state of expectancy for the miraculous. What happened to all the miracles that used to happen in church? Where'd they all go? If you go and read the great healing revival stories, so if you go back 100 years or 70, 80 years, the miraculous that happened in church on a regular basis was phenomenal. It was what marked us as charismatic Pentecostals. The gifts flowed, one of those being the gifts of miracles, sealing, signs and wonders flowed as part of the church. And, and, and we can't point the, the finger at the leadership of the church and say, it's Pastor Les's fault or it's Pastor Amon's fault. Or, it, the, the reality is it's our fault. We make up the church. We come to church without an expectation that God will touch me today. I know none of you do this because you're all believers, but those of you that know somebody that plays the lottery... <laughs> You're buying that ticket with an expectation. You check the numbers the next day. Nobody buys a lottery ticket and just throws it in the bin. You have an expectation. But yet Christians come to church with no expectation of a supernatural touch. Let me quickly define the miraculous for you. What is a miracle? It is the involvement of God supernaturally in the natural course of events. It's the involvement of God supernaturally in the natural course of events. It's God interjecting in something natural. Now, I've used the word, the phrase, the involvement of God. We will cover later on. Uh, there is a potential for uh, false miracles, and we'll look at that a little bit later on. 
But that's a great definition for the miraculous. The involvement of God supernaturally in the natural course of events. So there's a process and it's evident in that scripture I read you from John in the miracle at Cana. There's some very simple truths conveyed in that story, in that narrative that will help us understand uh, and position ourselves to receive more miraculous in our lives. For, for those of us that put our hands up and said, um, I'm, I'm believing God for a miracle, there's a process that we can apply. For those of us that actually need a miracle, but we stopped believing God because we got tired of waiting and being disappointed and being prayed for and nothing happening. There's lots of us here as well. For those of us as well, it's talking about just understanding and implementing this process. So I'm going to touch on uh, three simple things that become evident in that scripture. Number one, you need the presence of of the divine. You need the presence of the divine. Verse 2 of John 2, I'm, I'm referring to John 2 here, says, and both Jesus and his disciples were invited. They were there. Yeah? You need the presence. It speaks of our position in regard to the miraculous. It speaks of us coming to the one who can provide, coming into the place. And that's why the worship team did such an astounding job this morning because they did not know what I was preaching on. And yet we spent half an hour glorifying the power of a present God. It creates an opportunity for us to enter in. Um, I said this once to worship team, the church we were pastoring, and they didn't like it. <laughs> I said to them, you expect me to get up every Sunday and be on form? I was a preacher. You expect me to get up and have a word from God? Isn't that your expectation? Yeah. You expect me to stand up and preach something from God or Pastor Les or whoever's preaching. You don't expect me to get up and preach my latest fun thing I read or tell you a story. You expect to hear from the Word of God, one, one would hope. And I said to the worship team, I don't get a day off. I don't get to have a bad day. There's an expectation that I'm on form every Sunday. And I said to them, I have that expectation of you. I expect the worship team to be on form every Sunday. You ministers, you don't get to miss it. Because when the worship team misses it, or the preacher misses it, the people go hungry. What's the worship team's role? To throw open, effectively, this is my perception, to throw open the doors of the presence of God so that all of us can enter in to help us get there, to help us put aside the fears and the concerns and come to a place where we are focused on God. We've laid aside the sin and the weight and the failure and the successes and it's just me and, and a person touched by the grace and the mercy and the love of God worshiping the Father. That's what the worship team's job is, to get you there. Then it's the preacher's job to exploit there, to bring that word that changes and challenges you don't like the word exploit. Well, in the presence, in the Holy of Holies was where the presence of God sat. Yeah? Jesus said that in my presence there is fullness of joy. And where the joy of the Lord is, there is my strength. It's the preacher's job to bring us into the presence of God so that joy and strength and the word can work. Now, it's interesting that he says in verse 2, Jesus and his disciples. That's important because for, for us to grasp the miraculous, you need to understand that it's Jesus or his ministers. And that's not just talking about the fivefold ministers. It's about having the place where God is functioning and actively involved in and through the lives of people that can pray with you and encourage you and exhort you with a word and minister for you and we're to agree on earth concerning anything. That isn't to say that a miracle can't happen without a preacher or a teacher or a Christian because Jesus and his disciples, yeah? But it needs us to understand we've got to be in a place where we are present with the Lord present with those who know the Lord. Let me give you some scriptures. Acts chapter 5 and verse 12. At the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were taking place among the people. At the hands of the apostles. And for those of you that think that the, the 
Miracles have ceased. I'll deal with that later on. Acts chapter 19, verse 11. God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. What an amazing statement. Imagine if God was saying that. God started to perform extraordinary miracles at the hands of Amon. Woo, come on now. Why Paul? Because Paul was positioned. <laughs> Kenneth Hagin was asked, how do I get the healing anointing? He said, start praying for sick people. Position yourself where you need the gift. God's not going to give you the gift so that you can go. Go and he will give you the gift. Money follows ministry. God won't provide for you so that you can do ministry. Do ministry and God will provide. Amen. You want the power of God, start putting your hands on people that need to be touched by the power of God. Now, it is true that some people carry the gift of the working of miracles. According to 1 Corinthians 12, there is a spiritual gift. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 11 defines the spiritual gift. And one of them is the working of miracles. So it's true that certain people might be anointed with a gift to bring the miraculous into being. And they come and visit your church or you're at a conference or a crusade or whatever it is. And they carry a special anointing for that. I'm not denying that and, and, and get people like that to pray for you. But all believers can pray. Why? Because it's a response to faith. Let me read some scripture. Matthew 21 and 21. And Jesus answered and said to them, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, it will happen. And all things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. Now, we like to make that an allegory or metaphor. The, the mountain is our struggle. It doesn't say that in Scripture. It just says that if you have faith, you can move mountains physically. <laughs> Never seen anyone do that. Would like to. But it's understanding that it's a response to faith. And perhaps the most important verse you take out of there is verse 20 thing. And all things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. Christians, normal believers can do the miraculous. Mark 9 and 23. And Jesus said to him, if you can, a question, he's responding uh, to, to a question. They asked him, if it's, if it's your will, if you can do this. He says, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. All things, not some things. All things are possible to him who believes. And at this point, your mind is starting to be challenged. You're starting to look for the little rat runs to get away from the notion that you are able to believe God for all things. So we start creating these excuses as to why this thing won't work and that thing isn't our portion. And, this, and, and, and the scripture is very clear. All things. It's important for us to recognize that miracles are not just for the believer. Did you know that? They're not just for the believer. John 4 and verse 48. John 4 and 48. So Jesus said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. So he's talking to an unbeliever and saying, you, you want signs and wonders to believe. They are for the unbeliever. Now, <laughs> Let me just say this, to, to receive a miracle, you must recognize its source to some extent. It's very clear in John chapter 10 and verse 37 and 38. John 10, 37 and 38. If you do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do them, though you do not believe me, believe the works so that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the heaven. In, 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 so it's talking about his works, which part of were the miraculous. It's a sign that we can believe. However, you must understand that the devil can also produce signs. So what am I trying to say? Don't pursue the sign. Pursue the God. The signs follow. So my question is, why are the signs not following? Does God not want to bless us with miracles? 
Are we not in a position? Are we pursuing something incorrectly? Because the word's clear that where God is, there's much miracles. Just go and read it. Let me give you an example of satanic signs and wonders. We all make a big hoo-ah about signs and wonders, but we have to be careful. In Revelation chapter 13, verses 11 through 15, and then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. He exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, and he makes the earth and those who dwell in it worship the first beast. This is the, talking about the false prophet, yeah? Whose fatal wounds were healed. He performs great signs so that he can even make fire come down out of heaven to the earth in the presence of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which it was given to him to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wound of the sword and, the, and, 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 was to, and has come to life. And it was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast so that the beast would even speak. <laughs> this is false prophets who has the power to make a statue breathe and talk, to call fire out of heaven as a sign and a wonder. So, we, so you might be sitting going, oh, well, then I don't know if it's God or not. <laughs> Matthew 7, verse 9 through 11. Or what man is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? If you are asking God for a miracle, it's not coming from the devil. Amen. Just think rationally. So let's say I'm missing a leg. I've lost it in a motorcycle accident. I need a miracle. I need my leg to grow back. And I'm praying. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. The pastors are praying for me and my leg grows back. There it is. Is there anyone amongst you who are going to glorify the devil? No. The other side of the coin. I'm praying for the miracle. Same scenario. The devil thinks I'm going to bless him with a leg. Are there any amongst you who are going to praise the devil? No, because we're all asking God. So the devil has nothing to win, nothing to gain, by giving us the things we are asking God for. But if we are seeking for a sign so that we might believe, if we are seeking for a sign so that we might do or we might become, then it's a very, very valuable exercise to give you the sign you want. The things that I'm believing God for, the miracle that I'm standing in line for God for and waiting on God for is not going to do anything other than glorify God. It's not going to draw me away somewhere to some ungodly exercise of something. Don't fear about this thing, guys. You can identify the origin of something really, really easily. It's real simple. Is it in line with the Word of God? Is it in, if it's in the Bible, if it's in line with the Word of God, then you can believe it came from God. James 1, verse 17. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from God. Coming down with the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. If it's good, it came from God. If it's cancer, it came from the devil. If it's poverty, it came from the devil. If it's loss, it came from the devil. If it's confusion, doubt, pain, ignorance, it came from the devil. God does not bless you with evil things. If it's in line with the word of God. And, and does the witness of your spirit work? I wonder whether we as Christians are even listening to that small inner voice anymore. That thing inside that goes, you know, there's nothing visibly wrong. There's nothing out of line. I can't see anything wrong here, but... Mm. And then my wife and I will say, no, we don't feel right. My wife more than me will say, we don't feel right about that. And it frustrates people. Why is it not right? I just don't feel right. There's a witness in my spirit. There's a check in my spirit. Let me give you some scripture for that. Romans 8 and verse 6. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. If your mind is set on the things of the spirit, the witness will be there. There will be life and peace. Witness. John 15, 26. 
When the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, talking about the Holy Spirit, that is the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. There's a testament, testific, a testification, <laughs> a testimony of the Spirit in our lives because he dwells in us. And it's about what? The Word, the things of God. 1 John 5 and verse 6. 1 John 5 and 6, this is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not with the water only, but with the water and with the blood. It is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is truth. So there's, there's lots of scripture that talks about the role of the Spirit in that inner small voice. Learn to hear it, and learn to recognize it, and learn to obey it. It will solve you and save you at least an enormous amount of pain in your life. So don't fear about whether the miracle is from God or not. You'll know here. You just know, yeah. The Holy Spirit doesn't want you to fail at things. He wants you to succeed. I was standing preaching. Let me give you an example of this. I was preaching in the streets of Johannesburg one day. There were a couple hundred people listening. I um, gave an altar call. Uh, maybe, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 people got born again. I can't remember. There was a reasonable crowd. And um, called them all forward. Got them filled. Got them born again. And then started to witness to them about the Holy Spirit and asked if I could pray for them for the Holy Spirit. And they all said yes. So we prayed. And the power of God fell mightily. And they were all talking in tongues. And one old lady fell over on the floor, smacked her head on the concrete so hard, I thought it sounded like a watermelon popping. She was fine. It was amazing. Because where God is, people don't get hurt. You don't need catches where God is. You need catches when you live in the health and safety world. <laughs> um, anyway, being naughty. But one man at the back of this crowd started to talk loudly in a tongue that sounded like all the other tongues. But instantly my spirit went, mm, demonic tongue. What, you get such a thing? Yes, I heard it myself. Right there. And I was like praying for people. I was trying to get, so how do I get to them? And, and a couple that a lot more mature in my group, they moved over. They instantly witnessed with it. And they stood next to him. And I worked over to him. And I put my arms, God said to me, hug him. And I put my arms on him. He stuck his head in my chest. He started hissing like a snake. So I put my arms around him, took authority over the demon, cast it out, got him born again, got him spirit filled with a proper tongue, and away we go. How did I know if it sounded the same? The spirit witnessed. <clears throat> Something's not right here. It's fantastic at raising children. Mommy, I'm going out with Susie. <clears throat> really? Where are you going? Hmm. <laughs> All the children are looking nervous. God loves you more than he loves your parents. He doesn't want you to get into trouble with Susie. Okay, so number one, you need to be in the presence of the divine. Number two, you need to know your right to his involvement. You need to know your right to his involvement. So if the first one speaks to your position in regard to the miraculous, the second one is speaking to your qualifying for the miraculous. Being qualified to receive miracles. Are you entitled to a miracle? What does the word say? Because that's what counts. Never mind what the theologians say. Never mind what your experience says. What does the word say? Find out for yourself. Just because somebody somewhere doesn't believe in it doesn't mean it's applicable. I heard someone say this about atheists. Atheists believe there is no God. And he said, you don't get such a thing. They wounded theists. The, a theist is someone who believes in God. So an atheist is someone who used to believe in God and doesn't anymore because God didn't answer a prayer. They prayed for granny and granny died anyway. Or they, they saw a terrible car crash and a child was brutally dismembered in the car crash. And how can a loving God and a caring God allow that to happen to an innocent child? So they wounded the same thing is true about the miraculous. There's lots of people out there for whom it's easier to believe miracles aren't our portion than to have faith for a miracle. So go to the Word. Let the Word be your final arbitrator. So have miracles as a method of blessing by God passed away. This is an entire theological debate. People have got doctorates on the issue. They've made careers on it. It's called, con what's it, Dominique? Secessionism or, or continuismism. We continuismisms. 
Um, the secessionists believe miracles cease, the gift cease, the Holy Spirit cease to function in the church like he used to. And there's a plethora of them out there. There's whole denominations that believe that. Doesn't mean they're right. Let's look at some scriptures. John 14 and verse 12. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do, because I go to the Father. So, did Jesus perform miracles? Yes. Come on, work with me. It's not a test. And if he performed miracles, and he says, if I believe in him and you believe in him, we will do greater amounts. That's what greater works. It means greater of, greater amounts of. We will do greater amounts of the things he did. So therefore, why would God tell us that we could do miracles and then stop them from happening? How confusing is that? It's very clear. People will say, well, that's just applied to the apostolic age. Mark 9, 23, let me read it again. If, Jesus said to him, if you can believe, if you can, then he says, all things are possible. All things include the miraculous. Now, there's, there's lots of arguments against this. I'm going to just look at one, one scripture so I can show you how they pervert scripture. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 8 through 13. It says, love never fails, but if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away with or done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part and prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. So they say, well, the word has been fully given now after 400 years. The, the canon of scripture is closed. So the partial has passed away. The word is fully there. Therefore, we don't need the, the partial. The partial was until the word became full. So uh, already I have a problem because you could not really say that about love. Love is an action. It's not a word. Gifts of prophecy, maybe. Tongues, maybe. Knowledge? Are they trying to say that knowledge passed away when the Bible was finished? Well, we're in trouble then. Because as far as I understand it, most of the scientific advances of our world have happened in the last hundred years. So where'd that all come from? If knowledge had passed away, it's a facile, puerile argument. So what does it actually mean? <laughs> Verse 11, when I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with the childish things. Verse 12 is the key. And 13, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I have known in part, but then I will know fully. When will we see Jesus face to face? When the Bible is completed? Or one day when we die? Or when he returns? That's when it's complete. Until Jesus returns, the gifts are still in place. The gifts are still in place. He includes prophecies in this list. So prophecy should have passed away. But Jesus, says, the word says in Ephesians that, that God says he put gifts in the church until the church is mature. One of those gifts were pastors, teachers, evangelists, apostles, and prophets. So, if the other four are still there, then the prophecy is there as well. Because the other four haven't completed the maturity of the church yet. So, prophecy has a place. But yet, according to their interpretation of the scripture, prophecy has to have disappeared. But if you read to the end, as I did, it's very clearly talking about when you come face to face with God. Either in the, in, when you pass away and go home to be with Jesus, or when the end of the world happens. So it's not, it's not a scripture that says that prophecy and miracles have ended. So, clearly miracles haven't ended. Uh, and listen, I've seen some. I've done some. There's whole books about people that had ministry, powerful min, 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 uh, ministries of the miraculous. They've happened. I had a discussion with someone who doesn't believe in tongues anymore. He says tongues have passed away. I said, really? I said, what's this then? He says, you're making it up. I said, have a go. <laughs> go ahead and make it up. And you can't because your mind won't let you. Your mind won't let you babble like a one-year-old. And, and it kind of got him to go away and think about it. <laughs> There's a few more people I need to have that discussion with still. 
So do you qualify? Again, Mark chapter 9 and verse 23. I've quoted it a couple of times already tonight, today. And Jesus said, if you can, then he goes, all things are possible to him who believe. You qualify. If you believe, you qualify for a miracle. It's possible. Whatever you need God to do in your life, it's possible. You qualify because you're a believer. As a believer, you qualify for the miraculous. Number three. So the first one was you need, to, you need the presence of the divine. You need to be in the presence of the divine. In other words, your position in relation to the miraculous. Number two, you need to know your right to his involvement. In other words, your qualification for the miraculous. Number three is you must do what he tells you. That's like a four-letter word in, for Christians. You must, it's an imperative, you must do what he tells you. Not you should do, you can do, you may do if it suits you, what you feel like. <laughs> you must, you have to, do what he tells you to. This speaks about our responsibility. We have a responsibility in regard to the miraculous. We have to position ourselves somewhere. The miraculous doesn't just happen to everybody who wants one. It's not just out there and falls like rain on the just and the unjust. We have a responsibility in terms of our positioning. So let's take a little aside here and look at what hinders miracles from happening. Because that will give us a great idea of what we need to be doing to cause the miracle in our lives that we require and need to happen. And you can sum all of it up by saying this. It is an ignorance of the Word of God. Miracles don't happen in our lives because we don't know the Word of God. We're ignorant. The Bible says my people perish through lack of knowledge. Forgotten knowledge and ignored knowledge. You just don't know. You don't understand. You don't agree with it. Whatever it might be. All of it is summed up in that. Let's break it down a little bit. The first and probably the key thing is it's a lack of faith. It's a lack of believing that God can do what he said he will do. Matthew 13 and verse 58. And he did not do many miracles there, talking about Jesus, because of their unbelief. Even, even Jesus was stopped from miracles because of the unbelief of the reciprocant, the hearer, the crowd, the audience. They had unbelief, so he couldn't work miracles. His faith, listen to this, the faith of Christ was not sufficient to force a miracle on the unbeliever. The unbeliever, or, or the listener, sorry, not the unbeliever, the listener, the recipient, had to be in agreement, had to be in faith. And if you look at the miracles of Jesus, all over them, they dotted with, what can I do for you? What is it that you need? Do you understand it? Well, there, had, there had to be a buy-in. So a lack of faith is key, folks. If we, that's why the Bible says the just, those who are being made righteous, the justified, the born again, shall live by faith. Amen. Not so that we can get stuff, but so that we can be plugged into the supernatural outflow and downpour from God. Because it's faith that activates all that stuff. It's faith that makes it a home. It's faith that gives it a target for the guided missile of blessing from the Lord, if you want to use a weird metaphor. Do you understand? It's faith. And, and I like to use a, 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 um, a bit of poetic license. Forgive me. But could you imagine Jesus and God sitting on the throne, watching the church? Little pinpricks of light every now and then when the church does something it's supposed to do. There's the church. And then he sees Brother Amen on his knees believing God. And God sits forward and goes, that's my son. Come here, every, can't whistle my mouth drop. Get over here. That's my son. That's my boy. Look, he's in faith in the midst of all the evidence to the contrary. All the darkness. All the naysayers. All the wrong theologians. All the terrible preaching and teaching. That's my son. Why are you his son? Because you're reflecting his nature, his character. You're born again by faith. We have to walk by faith. We live by faith. 
everything that I have and am and are becoming is by faith in the one who 2,000 years ago hung on a cross with my name on his lips so that I could be resurrected with him, ascend with him and seat with him in glory and rule and reign with him as a co-heir. And that's what faith does. Forget about getting stuff. That's all ancillary. It happens. You get stuff with faith. You get stuff by loving your dad. <laughs> in the natural. If you want anything from your parents, be a good child. It's a whole lot easier. If you're a miserable, ugly child, you're depending on their love for you. But if you're a great child, then it's easier to love you. <laughs> Some of you are looking at him. What's he talking about? Be the son of God that reflects the heart and nature of God. Do things God's way. It's a whole lot easier. You see, we have this, we have this philosophy that says, we have this teaching that my faith moves God. My prayer moves God. No, it doesn't. Your faith moves you to God. When I'm in faith, it aligns me with the Father who is without shadow of turning. He's the same yesterday and today and forever. What do we think that God's going this way and Sean's praying and God's going, oh, faith, let's, let's move the entire of heaven this way now. No, faith aligns you with God. Faith prayer brings you into God's system, not God into your system. Faith will change you. Prayer, you start praying, Lord, my wife is a godless woman. She doesn't listen to me. Uh, change your heart, Lord. Lord, strike her dead, smote her with illness. Guess what will happen first? You'll change. God starts talking to you. Then suddenly your wife's not such a godless heathen anymore because you were actually the problem. So lack of faith will hinder the miraculous working in your life. Here's a really challenging one. I found this a few years ago while I was studying Galatians. Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? So then, then does he who provides you, uh, provide you with the Spirit and works miracles amongst you, do it by the work of the law or by the hearing of faith? I believe from that scripture there's a direct link between how traditional and legalistic we are how much miraculous we see. Jesus, Paul's saying to the, to the to Galatians, you got saved by faith, but now you're trying to live by works and law. Where the, where's the miracles gone? The, the miracles were done by faith. The miracles dry up when we're no longer in faith. For me personally, for you personally, and therefore, by extension, the church at large, we aren't seeing the miraculous in our lives because our faith has become a dry article instead of this vibrant, dynamic, glorious, uh, just overwhelming thing it was. Jesus says to the churches in, in Revelations, you've lost your first love. You've become lukewarm. You don't respond to my presence like you used to because you've made it all about stuff instead of about my presence. The last one I want to touch on, not allowing the Spirit of God by His Word to transform us so that we become doers of the Word. We don't allow the Spirit of God to use the Word to transform us and therefore allow us to become doers of the Word. There's, there's two scriptures I want to look at here. James chapter 1, verse 22 through 25. James 1, 22 through 25. But prove yourselves doers of the Word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in whatever he does. James is very clear. If you're talking about the word, Reading the word, quoting the word, 
Facebooking, TikToking, and Instagramming, and whatever else we do with the word, but not living the word, you're deceived, you're deluded. I mean, it's a really simple thing, you know. We, we say about this raising children. Children will do what you do, not what you say. So you can't be going, don't smoke, it's bad for you. Don't drink so much, it's really bad for you. Effing and blinding, hey, don't swear, it's rude. What they're doing is a reflection of you. Now, when your children grow up, and you only got saved in, when you were in your 40s or something, and your children grew up under the old you, they're going to manifest some of the old you. Don't beat yourself up about it. Go to the Lord about it. Yeah? But if you're a Christian and have been since your children were little, your children are a reflection of you. So I made a point, for example, of having a quiet time in the morning with my door open, never stop my children from walking in. Get out of here. Can't you see dad's praying? My wife has a quiet time in the lounge where the children can see so that the children know mom and dad don't just talk about quiet times. Mom and dad have quiet times. Do you understand? It it's demonstrates how you want to live. It's as simple as that. So <laughs> you aren't going to, in terms of the point, you must do what he tells you to do. If you don't do what the word is saying, you aren't put, putting yourself in a position for God to stand over his word and confirm it with signs and wonders. God stands over his word, not over your faith or your beliefs or your attitudes. Your faith must be in his word. Your actions must be in his, based on his word. It's his word that makes a difference. Nothing else. So your miracle is tearing for one of those three reasons, usually. You aren't doing what he tells you to do. And that's not about living right. God will only bless me when I'm living right. What's he telling you about the word? You don't know whether you are able or uh, 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 allowed to have a miracle. You don't know your rights. And, and lastly, you, 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 don't, you don't know the presence. You're not in the presence of God in your state of the miraculous, your need for the miraculous. Do you know it was a weird thing when, when my eldest daughter last year, early in the year when she had that thing with her, her ovary. Um, we heard about it on the Saturday morning and they wanted, to, they wanted to give her a full hysterectomy that Saturday afternoon. There was no time. It was literally, she went to see the doctor and an hour later they were talking about a full hysterectomy for this child, a month before her wedding. There wasn't time to, how do I feel and let's pray and intercede for six weeks and let's get the pastors involved and let's get some counsel and let's do a study on healing. There was right there and then, we have one go at this. The doctors are going to operate today, now. There's one prayer to be prayed. We phoned the pastors and said, this is what we're believing God for. And then we got together and we prayed. And I can honestly tell you, there was no place in all of that where the Spirit of God rose up in me, where I felt super spiritual. I felt like an assaulted, attacked, and battered father. But one who knows the word, as does my wife. And we got there, and it wasn't a prayer full of victory and a prayer full of emotion and feeling other than the pain, but it was a prayer from faith based on the word. And everything we asked God for, God did. Every single thing, there was about 11 of them. Every single thing God did. And there was no way celebration. It was just out of, in our brokenness, in the midst of the crisis, we knew our father and we knew the word to stand on. And we came to him on the basis of that. Your faith doesn't have to be some big showy thing. Your faith is how you react when the storms of life have trashed all the things you put value in. Your house has collapsed. All the pretty things are gone. What's left is your faith. And that's what God stands on. Don't wait for the storm to try and develop faith. Let me finish with verse 11 of John chapter 2. I read it to you in the beginning. I'll read it again. The beginning of his signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and revealed his glory and his disciples believed. We as believers, when we act in the supernatural and live in the supernatural and function in the supernatural, cause God to be glorified. Now I've said this before and I'm going to say it again and I'm going to correct myself because I've been meditating on it. Sometimes when the church has the miraculous People don't believe because of it. They come and observe. 
to get Ripley's Believe It or Not or some weird TV show. And um, The reason that happens is because we have one miracle every 42 years. But when you go and see and study the outbreakings of the miraculous in the history of the church, where John G. Lake, living in Spokane, Washington, had 100,000, 100,000 certifiable, by the medical profession, miracles. Then the church is not being laughed at. The TV shows are not making, look at the weird Christian over there. Then doctors in Spokane, Washington are saying to people, listen, you've got tuberculosis, it's fatal, but go to that church over there. They're having healing results, you'll get healed. You've got cancer, it's terminal, never mind treatment, go to the church. That's what was happening. Then, then God is being glorified. So the problem is when we see a little bit of a miraculous pop up here, we know it was all a miracle because it, it, it was what we were believing for. But everyone around us thinks, ah, oh, medicine just worked or something, you were just confused. or So it was one thing, so we don't believe. Folks, we need an outbreak in God's church of the miraculous. Everybody that raised their hands for a, for a miracle needs a miracle this year. Imagine what that would do to the testimony of God in this city if this church had 60 or 70 certifiable miracles this year. And it's not that God doesn't want to. God wants to. It's not that you aren't able and not allowed to and not positioned for. You are. God is here today. Where two or more gather in his name, there he is in the midst of us. The worship team threw open the throne room to us today. So why did you enter in? Did you enter in for an experience? Or did you enter in so that the mighty God can touch your hand? I'm going to give you an opportunity right now. If you want, I'm not going to call you out and I'm not going to have you stand at the front. I'm going to have you stand where you are so you can keep your need private. But if you put your hand up and you need a miracle, or if you didn't put your hand up but should have put your hand up, I want you just to stand. Just stand right where you are. Now understand, this is not about feeling. This is about faith. It doesn't matter what happens now. It's about faith. Church, look at the needs we have in this Bible believing church for a miraculous touch from God. I'm just going to pray and release an anointing for the miraculous over your life. Focus your heart on the Lord. Lord God, we've heard your word, you've challenged our heart, you've changed our thinking. And Holy Spirit is your children, washed in your blood, touched by your grace and your love and your mercy towards us. We open our lives to you today, Father, and we ask for the miraculous. Just begin to ask God for that thing. Lord, I pray that you would stand over your word this morning, and confirm it in the lives of your children, that your name would be glorified and their needs would be met in you, Father according to your riches in glory. I pray that every miraculous need is met today, Lord God. Father, I know that you would not have had me preach this word for any other reason. And so I ask you, Father, I release an anointing for the miraculous in this house, Lord. Meet every need. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. I want you to do something for me. When God gives you a miracle, come and tell Pastor Les. Let's start talking about it. Because that's how glory comes. It doesn't matter how big your miracle was or how small your miracle. The fact that you need a miracle means it's big to you. It's enormous to you. It's life-changing to you. Thank you very much. Take your seats. If you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then don't go from this place today without giving him that opportunity. I don't want to delay it anymore. I just want to say simply, don't go. If, if the Spirit of God has been talking to you, if in your heart here you know that you don't know this, what we've been talking about, this is not how you know God and you want to, then it's because Jesus is calling you. 
The Bible's very clear. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, salvation is your portion. That's all you need to do. That's all God will do to move you from darkness to light, from death to life. The Bible says that for every one of us, we're all sinners and the, the, the cost of the wages of that sin is to die, to be separate from God. But the alternative is in Christ. Don't go from this place today. Come and talk to me afterwards. Or Pastor Les or Pastor Lucy and I don't know if you can see the other pastors. Pastor Wisdom is in his orange dress. I was teasing him and he's in a lovely traditional Pastor Eamon and Mary. I don't know where the others are. Pastor Seja. Just come and talk to one of us and let us pray with you in agreement so we can bless you with the Bible. Pray this prayer with me. Close your eyes, everybody. Just all pray together. Father, I ask you, Almighty God, to forgive me of my sin. I repent and I ask you, Lord, to save my life. From this day forward, I will follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time or you recommitted your life with it, come and talk to one of us afterwards. We'd love to pray with you. Amen. Pastor Les. Thank you very much, church. He's done anyone leave. There's still some business to do. Oh, oh.